USDA logo, United States Department of Agriculture. All right, good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to our event, Land Matters, Understanding Heirs Property. I'm glad you could join us this morning. Before I introduce myself and start the program, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. Located in Prince George's County, Maryland, the National Agricultural Library stands on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people, who were among the first in the Western Hemisphere to encounter European colonists. We pay our respect to Piscataway elders past and present and acknowledge the need to protect and honor the history and the people of this place. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today, here today at least virtually, on these Piscataway lands. So good morning, I'm Paul Wester. I'm the director of the National Agricultural Library here in Beltsville, Maryland. The National Agricultural Library was created on May 15th, 1862 uh, by legislation signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln, which established the um, United States Department of Agriculture. Today is one of five national libraries in the United States and as part of the USDA's Agricultural Research Service, the National Ag Library holds one of the most extensive and unique agriculture and related science materials collections in the world. Serving USDA scientists and administrators, researchers and the public, the library facilitates the creation of agricultural knowledge through the acquisition and dissemination of agricultural information. The Agricultural Law Information Partnership at the National Agricultural Library was, is, is the organization that has organized today's event. The partnership represents a collaboration between the National Agricultural Library, the National Agricultural Law Center, and the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at the Vermont Law School. The Agricultural Law Information Partnership connects farmers, producers, consumers, and legal professionals with the agricultural and food law information that they need to ensure a thriving American agricultural enterprise. Today's event will focus on heirs' property, a complex multifaceted issue that disproportionately contributed to land loss for African-Americans throughout the United States. Heirs' property issues also impact Latinx communities in the Southwest, indigenous communities living on reservations, and white communities in Appalachia. Heirs' property is a property that passes to family members by inheritance, usually without a will or, or, an, or an estate planning strategy. Our agricultural law partners and keynote speaker will explain the complexities of heirs property and introduce valuable resources to assist those helping address heirs property issues. These resources can help facilitate changes needed to ensure families retain their land. I would now like to say a few words on the value of, of today's and this afternoon's really editing session. Wikipedia is among the top 10 sites visited daily and serves as the first step for many when conducting research, often as, often as a quick jumping off point to additional resources. Around the world, Wikipedia is accessed by over 1 billion unique visitors each month. Today, we will add resources and links to Wikipedia related to the resources discussed by our speakers. This helps ensure that the public has access to quality information in the place they are most likely to look for it first. Wikipedia relies on volunteer editors and programs like this Editathon to ensure that reliable information is disseminated, articles are improved, and gaps in knowledge are filled. Over the past three years, the National Agricultural Library has hosted Editathons related to a number of subjects, including um, the history of the National Ag Library and USDA itself, agricultural history um, in general and in partnership with the Na National Archives and Records Administration, USDA Women in Science, Food Safety Modernization Act, and the Invasive Species Act. With our Wikipedian in residence, Jamie Flood, we've increased agricultural information on Wikipedia, updated articles about laws and regulations, highlighted NAL and USDA projects and people. So thanks so much for your leadership, Jamie. In just a moment, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Mavis Gregg, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Air Shares and Director of the Sustainable Forestry and African-American Land Retention Project at the American Forest Foundation. 
We will also hear from two of our agricultural law partners, Rusty Rumley, the senior staff attorney at the National Agricultural Law Center, and Francine Miller, senior staff attorney and adjunct professor at the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at Vermont Law School. We're pleased to have Mavis, Rusty, and Fran here with us today. Our morning session will conclude around 11.15, followed by a lunch break until noon. Shortly after 12 noon Eastern time or 11 um, Central, uh, Jamie Flood will host a brief Wikipedia editing um, training. This training will be useful to users of all experience levels and demonstrate how you can contribute um, to the Edit-a-thon today. Editing will begin around 1240 and will continue until about 3 p.m. this afternoon. Jamie and other experienced Wikipedians will be available to help throughout the day and will reach out to our speakers and other experts for answers to subject-specific questions. I'll also note that while we hope you'll join us for all of today's events, um, you should feel free to come and go as you please and as you can. So again, welcome everyone. I'm excited to see all the work that will be inspired by today's events. So without further ado, please let me um, introduce or introduce again, um, uh, Mavis Gregg and turn the program over to her. As I noted before, Ms. Gregg is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of AirShares and the Director of the Sustainable Forestry and African-American Land Retention Project at the American Forest, Forest Foundation a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Pepperdine University School of Law. Ms. Gregg also chairs the North Carolina Parks and Recreation Authority and serves on the board of directors for the Triangle Land Conservancy. So thank you so much, uh, Ms. Gregg, for being our keynote um, speaker this morning for our Land Matters Understanding Heirs Property Edit-a-thon and offering the keynote, the keynote remarks on this important topic. So take it away and thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you everyone who's joining us today. Thank you for the invitation to talk about a topic I feel very passionate about. Um, in addition to what Paul shared about my, my background, um, I essentially am a death and dirt attorney who um, am, has centered, um, I've centered my work on working with families who are primarily land rich, cash poor, and many of those families are families that own heirs property, which we're gonna learn about today. Um, and surprisingly, my um, doing this work has led me to agriculture. Um, if you would have asked me when I decided to become a lawyer, if I would ever work with forestry or ever work with farmers, I would say, why would I do that? I'm from a, a, a rural area in Western North Carolina, but certainly did not grow up on a farm, um, did not grow up in the agricultural space. But what I've learned over time is uh, one, the importance of agriculture to our, our communities, to our, our country, um, but also that land ownership is directly tied to agriculture and that many families who are, are pursuing the American dream have difficulty, um, you know, whether it's in agriculture culture or, or just purely owning um, own land and real estate over multiple generations. And so it's very exciting to be able to be in the space and be among all of these um, wonderful peers. And I'm very excited that you all are um, thinking about heirs property and how the information about heirs property can be improved and, and disseminated very widely. Um, we can skip or go to the next slide and actually skip this slide. Um, so I'm going to dive right in and I will share that this is going to be somewhat interactive. We're going to go to law school for a little bit and I'm going to ask that you use the chat box feature to answer some questions that I will pose to you in just a minute. Um, the first question actually I'll pose now. Uh, curious, among the participants, who in here has ever heard of heirs property? If you will just indicate that you, whether you have heard of heirs property before in the chat. And also if you have, if you own heirs property like I do, we share in the chat. So some people have heard, it looks like most people have heard um, and some people are looking it up. Well, hopefully you'll learn today a lot about heirs property. Uh, I also have property with my siblings. This is a family tree, which I think is probably familiar to most people here today, a family tree where we have around um, um, four generations of the family. And just to give you some details about this family, at the top, the top two boxes are the um, original um, owners of the property. And let's just say for, for today that this is a married couple 
And, and then the next row is um, their children. So this couple, like many people, had children. Um, they have four children. And then the yellow boxes are spouses. So like many family trees, they grow to include non-blood relatives, such as spouses. And so we have spouses. And then the next row in the peach colored boxes represent children, um, so grandchildren of our original owners. And so all of the original owner's children had children themselves. And then a couple of them even had grandchildren. So four generations of this family and an expansion of this family uh, to include spouses. And let's also imagine that this family has um, 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 has acquired 40 acres of land and have kept it in the family for the multiple generations. And each of the persons in this family tree that has an X in their box is deceased. And let's just imagine that they just, they passed away in, um, from top to bottom. So our original owner has passed away first. Our, um, the children that um, have passed away, passed away after that. The two spouses that have passed away, passed away after their spouses and the grandchildren who passed away, uh, passed away last. And like most American families, um, there were no succession plans. There was no, there was no estate planning. There were no wills. And let me pause. Um, a, a succession plan is a plan to, um, um, address any kind of changes that occur, significant changes that occur. So it could be death, it could be um, a change in who is managing. Um, a, an estate plan, as you know, is planning to um, how your assets will be handled and how you will be taken care of um, if you are no longer able to take care of yourself and planning for what would happen after you pass away. And so like most Americans, no one in this family had any kind of plans and instead relied on the laws that apply when we don't have our own plans. Now, thinking about our, our original owners, married couple, um, they acquired together and there's a deed that demonstrates that they own the property. Now. Uh, question for the chat box. Um, when the first spouse passes away, who becomes the owner of our property? I promise no grading. So someone said H, I think that means husband. Someone said depends. Okay, any other thoughts? The living spouse, the surviving spouse, depends on the state. Yeah, those are great responses. So, um, in, uh, I believe in all states and DC, when a couple acquires property together um, by deed, they automatically own it with a right of survivorship. In North Carolina, we refer to this bundle of rights as tenants by the entirety, but our state laws um, provide for spouses who acquire property together to own it with rights of survivorship. And you actually have to take additional steps to change that particular type of ownership, but the inherent nature of, of the ownership of married couples is that they own it with rights of survivorship. And so in this case, the property went to the surviving spouse. And now let's imagine that the surviving spouse has passed away. Um, and again, there are no, the surviving spouse did not have a will, did not have any kind of succession plan. They died owning the property individually. So when the surviving spouse passes away, who became the owners of the 40 acres and what did they get? Folks are thinking, please put your response in the chat box. I appreciate the thoughtfulness that you're giving to this. Oh, an entity consisting of the four children. The four children receive as tenants in common. Jillian, that is correct. Um, so the they what the the new owners or the the owners that um, um, have the property now are the four children, and they have an undivided interest in the property, and they have an equal share in the property. And that's significant that they have an undivided interest because they own the property as tenants in common, and they all they all are entitled to use the entire property. It doesn't physically divide into um, 10 acres each. Instead, they all own the whole together and the percentage of their interest is 25% or one fourth. 
Now, again, let's imagine that our siblings have passed away. So the four children of our original two owners have passed away. And as mentioned before, the other family members, the two spouses, um, as indicated in the yellow boxes, and then three grandchildren have passed away. Based on what you understand about how ownership of property transfers through inheritance, um, how many owners do you think we have today? So all of the exes are people who are deceased and ownership has passed from the top through the bottom. So I see 12, I see, I believe 14, maybe 144. <laughs> hey, Mark, good to see you on here. 16, 20. So one thing that you're illustrating is that we don't agree. Um, we all have different understandings of how inheritance law um, works and who is entitled to become an owner. And that's common among heirs property owners too. A lot of families own heirs property and not are not really um, clear on who becomes owners of the property and who should become owners of the property. Oftentimes people don't believe that non-blood family members are entitled to own property. A lot of people believe that um, the ownership is generational rather than multi-generational. Um, but the truth, if we go to our next slide, is that we have oh, my glamour shot, 16. Now, of course, this is based on the set of laws that apply in North Carolina. Um, I recently did a multi-state survey of all 50 states plus G, uh, DC of inheritance law. And quite frankly, <laughs> The number of owners we have today really does depend on the state and states have very different approaches. Some states have very, I would describe antiquated approaches, um, particularly as it relates to what spouses inherit. Um, but if we were in North Carolina, so I did kind of trick you, but if we were in North Carolina, we, had, we would have 16 owners. Um, next slide, please. And the reason why we have um, this mixture of owners with various shares is because of the intestate succession laws. So intestate succession applies to inheritance when there is no will. If you have will, it's the term we use is, is um, um, testate. When you don't have a will, the term we use is intestate, meaning that there's no will. And when someone dies without a will, we don't have anything to inform of who their heirs are until we look at the intestate succession laws and look at who survived the individual. And so in North Carolina, if you die with children but no spouse, it's pretty straightforward and pretty much aligned with what most families want. The children inherit everything. If you die with a spouse but no descendants, so that's children, grandchildren, et cetera, and no parents, spouse inherits everything. Notice I mentioned a spouse and no descendants or parents. Now, if you have a spouse and one child or descendants of one child, it gets a little bit more complicated because your spouse becomes um, um, or inherits a half interest and your children inherit a half interest. And then it gets even more complicated if you have two or more children or descendants of those children and a spouse. And um, I apologize, the fraction in this um, scenario is off, but the spouse would inherit one third and the children or descendants would in inherit two thirds, the remaining two thirds of your real estate. And then it gets even more complicated. So potentially your spouse and your parents could inherit um, property together and your parents could inherit everything. And if you think about how dynamic families are and how sometimes you may have, well, one, you know, having your parents inherit from your estate could create financial challenges and other challenges for your parents, depending on their age and whether they're relying on government assistance. It could also be inherited by your siblings and descendants of any deceased siblings. And, you know, I mentioned that I own heirs property with my siblings. Um, 
if my siblings were to inherit my estate, you know, everything that I own, which is pretty modest, it includes a Honda Civic, some art, um, some real estate, I'm pretty sure that my siblings would liquidate everything to support their lavish lifestyles, <laughs> which I wouldn't enjoy. So I do have a will, of course. Um, but my point about intestate succession is one, it's difficult to trace ownership of heirs property over time when it's being passed through inheritance, because we really do have to look at the um, family tree and identify with each person who's deceased what has occurred um, and who survived them and apply the applicable laws. Um, so let's look at the legal structure of heirs property. Next slide. All right. So as I mentioned, the ownership is through inheritance. There's two ways to transfer ownership of real estate. You can use a deed or you can inherit real estate. So anyone that dies owning real estate it automatically, the ownership automatically transfers by virtue of them dying. It's just who receives the property needs to be ascertained based on the law or if there is a will, what the will says. Um, another aspect of the legal structure, as someone mentioned, is that they own it as tenants in common. So that's a very specific bundle of rights. And it's different from owning property as tenants by the entireties, which is uh, applicable to married couples only or joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Tenants in common do not have rights of survivorship. In fact, what they do have is it requires unanimous decision-making, meaning any type of legal decision related to the property requires unanimous vote from all of the owners. And if you recall, we had difficulty even agreeing on how many owners there are. What if you are trying to decide on whether to use the property to borrow money and get it fixed up or whether you want to license um, the property, license people to use the property for hunting or lease the property to a farmer in the area? It legally requires unanimous decision making. Um, any owner has the right to transfer their own chair. So any owner can transfer their share to whomever they want while they're alive using a deed. And when they pass away, their share goes to whomever they appoint in their will, or if they don't have a will, to, um, to their heirs through intestate succession. And then finally, every owner has the right to seek what we call partition. And there's two types of partition actions. One type is a partition in kind, and courts have to first consider partition in kind, and that's physical division of the property. If a partition in kind is not possible, then the court has to force the sale of the property. And this is typically done by auction, um, and you'll hear from our colleague later um, how that has changed with the introduction of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. Next slide. Thank you, Jamie. So um, one of the challenges of heirs property is that owners cannot prove that they own the property. And again, this is because ownership is passing from generation to generation, person to person through inheritance. It's also very difficult to find attorneys who are willing and capable of, oh, sorry, I thought someone was speaking up. Is someone speaking up? Oh. Mary Jo, you are um, not muted. Um, it's also difficult to find an attorney who can assist you, who has the capacity and also is willing to assist you with confirming ownership, confirming who the current owners are. It's also very expensive to resolve. So um, even though many landowners of various um, socioeconomic status have heirs property, many are unable to actually afford the legal services needed to resolve the challenges that they face, including confirming who owners are. And then that, of course, leads to millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in lost wealth and in um, lost financial assistance. Families literally leave money on the table because they are unable to prove that they own the property. And that's just one hurdle that they face. Next slide. So how do we confirm ownership of heirs property? So this is a more complex family tree 
And I will say in my experience, this family tree is more, more common than the first family tree that I showed you um, because families grow over time. And if you have a family um, with heirs property that came into the family, say in the early 1900s, their family tree is likely going to look very similar to this. And I've actually had some families whose family tree looks even bigger and more complex. And at the bottom of this um, um, slide, you'll see a timeline. So in this scenario, the family became owners of the property in 1948. And we see these dots along the lines, um, along the timeline. These are different events that have occurred between 1948 and 2021 that impact the identification of owners that impact the ownership of the property. And so as an attorney, it's important that we create a paper trail for what has transpired from 1948 to 2021. Um, it's also necessary to perform complicated math. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, most lawyers are very bad at math. <laughs> um, math is not our forte. There are, of course, lawyers who are great at math, but we're not known for our math skills. But we are tasked with calculating based on the statutes um, what percent ownership each owner has and what they pass on. Um, it often involves dealing with uh, multiple jurisdictions. So um, thinking about the African-American family, for example, most African-American land ownership, especially agricultural land ownership, is in the Southeast or in the United States. And most African-American families acquired their agricultural land in the early 1900s, very shortly after slavery ended. And they've maintained ownership through inheritance over multiple decades, many decades. And a lot of African-American family members are situated both in the Southeastern United States, but also in the Northeastern United States. You may be familiar with the Great Migration. This refers to this period of time when many African-American family members moved, migrated to the Northeastern United States, some even to the Midwest and to the Western United States to escape the um, violence and, and discrimination that was happening during the Jim Crow era of, of our country's history. And so when it comes to heirs property and identifying who the current owners are, attorneys necessarily have to source paperwork from various jurisdictions. Um, in my law practice, working with landowners in North Carolina, many of the families that I worked with had relatives that were in Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and the DC area. So DC, um, Maryland and Virginia. And it wasn't unusual for me to have to identify county records for family members in multiple states, including North Carolina. And so then adding to the challenges is that it is efficient, it does require what I would describe as inefficient crowdsourcing of information. Um, oftentimes family members will have chunks of information and you'll have to talk to other family members in order to build the, the full picture. And it um, often results in inadequate tree building, but the tree is very crucial to the process of clearing or confirming who the owners are for heirs property. Uh, next slide. And I promise you, this isn't meant to make you feel sad because <laughs> there are some, there is a lot of hope for heirs property owners that we'll talk about in a minute. But I, again, just focusing on the issues um, because of how they own the property, um, you know, tenants in common with individual owners having the right to transfer the share, individual owners having the right to seek partition action. For families, there's a significant threat of loss of ownership of their family property. Um, what happens commonly is that individual family member owners will transfer their shares to third parties. Um, it could be the neighboring commercial farm. It could be the real estate developer. Anytime there's some sort of market pressure or um, external factor driving interest in land, um, um, 
surrounding heirs' property, there is the threat of loss. And what these individuals will do by buying these individual shares is they will use their rights as an owner, as a tenant in common, um, to seek a partition sale of the property. And when that property is sold at partition sale, it's often sold at a, uh, a value that's less than fair market value. And from those proceeds, you have to pay for the court expenses, et cetera. And then that income is distributed among the heirs. And it's often far less than the wealth, the value of the asset before it was partitioned. And so not only are they losing their actual real estate, they're losing intergenerational wealth. Many families also, because they can't prove ownership, are ineligible for assistance. Um, we have seen great strides um, in recent years, starting with the USDA in the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, they introduced provisions for heirs property owners to obtain a farm and tract number, which is which I describe to laypersons as the social security number for your agricultural land. Um, so they extended the criteria, the eligibility criteria for farm and track members so the heirs property owners could qualify for that. And the um, requirements for that assistance for that farm and track number um, vary depending on what state you're in. So if you're in a state that has adopted the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, the criteria is has is very specific. And if you're in a state that has not adopted that legislation, the criteria is very specific to, to that those states. Um, other issues, as I mentioned, you don't have legal standing. So if you can't prove that you own the property, you also don't have the ability to defend your property. So say there's a boundary dispute with a neighbor or there is a, an imminent domain action. Any type of legal action related to your property would be difficult to defend if you can't prove your ownership. It's also rife with conflict. You know, I love my siblings, um, but we barely manage to pay the taxes. I mean, we can afford the taxes, but every year it's a small episode of drama in which we're trying to make sure that everyone pays their share of the property taxes. And that's just a small example. Uh, many families have very significant conflict that leads to under management of the property and even loss. Um, and the impairments uh, that um, are that come along with heirs property extend beyond families. Um, it, it disrupts food systems and supply chains. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a, a corporation and a um, NGO that looked at heirs property in Alabama and Mississippi and determined that there was so much heirs property and um, so much risk for that property to either be developed or fractionalized, so split into smaller parcels, that um, it was a threat to the supply chain for this corporation and also a threat for the conservation objectives of this NGO. It also affects affordable housing. So to the extent that families are losing their heirs property, you know, especially heirs property that serves as um, place of home, place of residence, uh, these families that lose it no longer have access to that and no longer have access, for many no longer have access to affordable housing. Heirs property is a significant issue in New York City. So families that acquired real estate, again, in the early 1900s and have been using it as a form of housing are now suffering loss, you know, with these third parties who buy an interest and then forced to sell the property. And I mean, at least for me, um, living in North Carolina, the cost of living in New York is substantial. New York City is substantial. And so for many families, that displacement could be life changing. Um, and then there are threats, of course, to natural resource protection and threats of economic blight. There are whole towns, um, whole communities that have experienced economic blight because of how much heirs property there is, along with other issues. This map is a map of North Carolina, um, and it was developed by Wake Forest Law School Environmental Law Clinic together with the Spatial Justice Institute at Winston-Salem State University, which is a historically black college and university. And basically we, they sought to illustrate how much heirs property there likely is in North Carolina. And so the red dots indicate heirs property. And they overlaid this with census data about where black people live in, in North Carolina. And so if you look at this map, 
you see that there's a significant um, overlay with heirs property in the counties that have high proportions of African-Americans. And I do think that that's very striking. Again, I'll reference back to the Jim Crow era in our country where many families, many African-American families were um, um, ex um, exposed to a lot of violence and discrimination. For them, the model of passing ownership through inheritance, which does not require, as I mentioned, does not require filing any paperwork with the court system, um, it was actually a protective measure to ensure that they could keep their land. They intentionally would pass ownership through um, inheritance, through intestate succession. You know, they would intentionally forego having wills that you have to file with the county clerk or with the whatever office in your county as a measure of protecting it. So I want to make sure that no one... Um, 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 has, makes a direct correlation with African-American heirs property ownership and failure to plan. Um, for many families, the decision was conscious, you know, to not plan within the formal legal system in order to protect their property. Um, but this map also short, certainly points out that there's just lots of heirs property in North Carolina. I'm from the western part of the state, um, in the Appalachian Mountains. And as we can see, there's a lot of heirs property there and it necessarily is changing the vistas that we have there because families that own land on mountains um, that own it as heirs property have also experienced the same type of loss because of development pressures and pressures from um, the real estate market where it's, it's pretty booming in that area. Next slide. Oh, I think I have one more minute. Okay, so I'll speed up. Um, I just wanted to share this map. This map is also from North Carolina. This is from the Southern Environmental Law Center. And um, one day I'll have this map overlaid with the other map. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, we see here to the eastern part of the state coastal flooding. And then we see a lot of confined animal or concentrated animal feeding operations, coal ash sites, um, um, different types of activities that have Okay, thank you. Um, different types of activities that, you know, if you, um, if those activities are harmful to um, your family, or if those activities are not supportive of your family's real estate, if you don't, if you have heirs property and you can't prove ownership, um, it can be very difficult for you to defend your property. Next slide. Um, and so there are a lot of incentives to um, address the challenges that heirs property owners face. There's a lot of in, uh, incentive for both heirs property owners and for those of us who work with landowners. Um, resiliency is one of the biggest incentives. You know, resiliency I think of as your ability to respond to significant change. And if we think about how um, how devastating change can be, it necessarily can impact families for multiple generations. And it does, especially with heirs property. And so it's really important to build your resiliency by confirming ownership and making sure that there are solid plans that address when changes occur. And the changes range from changes in ownership, changes in who is owning the land or benefiting from the land, um, also changes in who's managing the land. Um, just because you have multiple family members attached to the land, it, it, not, it, it's not always the case that you have multiple family members who are managing the real estate. Um, of course, environmental and agricultural stewardship are also incentives to addressing heirs' property, intergenerational wealth, and of course, legal standing. Next slide. So solutions. So we talked a little bit about how we um, uh, clear title, how we confirm ownership of heirs property. But I also wanted to um, offer that on an individual basis, um, succession planning to avoid heirs property is really important. And I think of succession planning as more expansive than estate planning. Um, in the media and elsewhere, you will often hear people say that heirs property is caused by a lack of wills, or by lack of having wills or estate plans, but wills only address one generation. They aren't comprehensive enough to address 
multiple generations of ownerships. Families really need to think of their real estate, their family owned real estate as a business and develop a strategy that allows for management over multiple generations and management that is sustainable. And um, for us, um, that would be most likely single entity ownership, meaning that the family transfers ownership of the property into an individual entity that is set up with the family's unique circumstances in, in mind and addresses the different types of, of, of issues and goals that the family has. So single entity, since single entity ownership is really um, ideal in that it can provide for, for those um, comprehensive plans. That starts with, of course, confirming who the owners are using the family tree and then working with an attorney who, to confirm the owners. And then the owner is making a decision about what type of, of uh, goals they have and whether they want to transfer ownership into a single entity owner. Of course, um, single entity ownership is not ideal for every family, nor is it manageable by every family. And so we highly recommend working with attorneys who are skilled in both real estate law, estate law, um, business law, and perhaps even tax law. Um, other legal and policy solutions um, that we have seen recently for heirs property owners are the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which again, my colleague Rusty is going to talk about more in depth, but I would describe it um, briefly as legislation that when it's adopted by a state provides families with more due process rights when their property, when their heirs property is subject to a um, partition action. So it's been a huge, um, is the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act has been a, a, a hugely important um, type of legislation that states are implementing. And it's really exciting to see that more and more states are implementing this legislation. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, we have the Farm Bill. I shared with you about the farm and tract numbers that Farm Bill 2018 provides for heirs property owners. Um, that same Farm Bill also create, establishes a loan program in which the USDA secretary will loan um, money to qualified entities. Um, I'll, I'll spare you that, well, I'll, I'll say the CDFIs, qualified CDFIs that have experience lending to um, specific types of groups, those institutions can then relend that, those dollars to heirs property owners to do succession planning, to resolve legal issues, um, to do appraisals, et cetera. And then of course, we've learned recently that FEMA has expanded its eligibility criteria. And this is also very significant. Um, and I would say game-changing for heirs property owners in areas that are um, often hit by disaster. States are doing so as well. And then we still need more legal and policy solutions. So we need technology-driven innovation. We need a robust private practice. Mostly we rely on the, the nonprofit um, legal sector for working with heirs property owners, but certainly we need more attorneys doing this. Um, and then other um, items that I've listed here that perhaps will be shared if, this, um, if the slides are provided. Um, next slide. Um, and just a little note about AirShares, the company that I found it, we are actually developing a tool to create the family tree. Um, so it's complementary to legal services and will offer more affordable technology for landowners to do this really important step. And it's powered by our algorithms that trace ownership. So that's been really exciting for me to, to now essentially have a tech company um, to help address this really significant legal issue. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. I look forward to all your questions when we have the Q&A after our next two speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mavis. That was great. Uh, next up from the National Agricultural Law Center in Fayetteville, Arkansas, we have Rusty Rumley, Senior Staff Attorney. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, this is actually a topic I cover quite often uh, air property and succession planning as well. I'm really glad Mavis talked about the importance of succession planning because I really think that is not a topic that gets anywhere near enough uh, 
uh, coverage when it comes to agricultural uh, situations. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about us here at the center. Um, we're, a, we're kind of a unique entity. We're, uh, we're federally funded, so we can't provide legal advice. So if you ask a question and I rephrase your question, I'm not trying to duck your question. I'm actually trying to turn it so that I'm providing legal information as opposed to legal advice, which I'm not allowed to do. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, the resources I'm going to talk about today we have on our website, nationalaglawcenter.org. Uh, we cover estate planning, but we also cover a lot of other areas out there. I mean, everything from uh, water, uh, water issues, uh, leasing. Uh, I mean, if, if it relates to agricultural, food, or environmental law, we've got resources on it. Our goal is to try to provide resources for people so that they can educate themselves on the front end before you go in and talk to the attorney. I mean, you can always go into the talk to the attorney with no background, and most attorneys are going to be more than happy to provide all the education you want. Just the issue is they typically tend to charge you for the for the education. So we try to give people a good resource that they can bone up on a particular area before they go and talk to that attorney. All right, next slide, please. Whew, so I got the uh, introductory materials out of the way. Uh, so how did we get here? So like Mavis had talked about, you know, the lack of estate planning can be one issue, and that's usually the issue people will point to. It's actually possible to create air property and have a will, and this happens all of the time, and it's something that I, I don't think people realize. If you do a simple will and you just say, I leave my land to my kids equally, then you've just created air property. I mean, it's going to be tenants in common. And you're in the same situation whether or not you uh, you would have had, you've blitzed your land transfer through intestate succession. So, a lot of people will say, you know, oh, well, it, you know, air property it's always caused by a lack of a, an estate plan. That's not true. Uh, people, especially people that go out and do their own uh, wills, try to do their own wills, or they use something like Legal Zoom, or they work with an attorney that doesn't have a lot of experience dealing with ag clients. You know, leaving a, a, a house at a white picket fence to your three kids, they're going to sell it. And that's fine. That's typically what happens. Um, that may not be what you want to happen to your family land, though. And it's important that you talk to an attorney that knows what they're doing, that's got some experience with agriculture, to make sure they're looking at things like, do we want to, are we accidentally creating an air property situation? even though we've gone out and paid the money to have a, an estate plan or a succession plan put in place. Uh, I'm not gonna cover a whole lot of these because Mavis talked about them, about the, the problems that we run into with air property. I think she did a great job talking about the 2018 Farm Bill programs. I'm particularly excited about the loan program. I think that's going to be really beneficial to help people uh, clear up title to their property. Uh, some of these legal expenses can be pretty expensive. I mean, especially if you've had a, a land that's been air property for two or three generations, uh, these things can get really complicated. And when you think about, you know, we don't have nuclear families anymore. I mean, divorces it happens, you have stepkids, you have adopted kids. Uh, these family trees can get really, really complicated really quickly. So, they can be expensive. Uh, so that I, I think the loan program is going to be a huge help whenever they get it fully implemented. It generally takes a couple of years for farm bill programs to get implemented. I mean, I, I know we're talking about the 2018 farm bill. Uh, it, it typically takes three, four or five years for some of these programs to get put in place, especially if they're brand new. So I, I think we'll be seeing more about the loan program coming you know, in the next couple of years. But all right, next slide, please. One thing I can't stress enough is that there are no two farms in the entire world that are the exact same. And there are no two families in the entire world that are the exact same. So when you're dealing with air property, there is no cookie cutter solution. It would be so much simpler and cheaper if there was a easy way that you could just plug and play and you, know, you insert data into this equation and it spits out an answer. It doesn't work that way with air property. So 
And some of the things that we talk about, when I, like I said, I'm going to talk more about the Uniform Partition of Air Property Act. It is a process that's trying to resolve a problem, but it's not a perfect solution because there's no one size fits all solution to this problem. It's just, it's too, it's too diverse. It's too difficult. It, there's, it just, it doesn't work out quite the way we'd like it to. So realize that, you know, this is the reason why you have to pay attorneys to, to help with this is because there's not a, a simple way to address it uh, in most instances. All right, next slide, please. Um, your options can vary based on the state you're in. So right now we have 18 states that have, and the US Virgin Islands, that have adopted the Uniform Petition of Air Property Act. So most states haven't done it yet. Uh, if you're in one of those UPHPA states, uh, you definitely have a leg up on the situation. Uh, for people that don't reside in those states, uh, you might want to, states are adopting this pretty quickly. So uh, this is actually, as far as like uniform laws go, I and mean, usually these things take decades to kind of sweep across the country. This has only been out there since 2010. We're already up to uh, 18 states. Uh, and I, I think we'll be, this will be crossing the country pretty quickly. So that is one thing that I think is a, a potential benefit for people that are in an air property situation. There are different remedies out there. Uh, anytime you can consolidate ownership into one entity, that's usually typically the best outcome because it prevents the air property situation from occurring in the future. But there are other ways to address it. The traditional one has been the partition by sale. Uh, that's if one person who's a tenant in common wants out of it, they can force the land to be sold. As Mavis was talking about, that's typically not done at fair market value. That's done uh, at auction. And depending on your state, it's a lot of times it's done on the courthouse steps. You know, if you have two or three people show up, you don't get much of a bidding war. So price the price it can be substantially less than what land's being sold at this you know being sold by a real estate company uh for some people out there they still do the maintain the status quo as an approach i know uh, a a guy that we uh we rent some land off of he owns property as, as air property he doesn't have the money to buy out the other owners he only wants to use the land for hunting and fishing uh, and none of the other co-owners actually realize that they are they have an ownership interest in the land. So his his solution to it is he's going to keep his mouth shut. He pays the property tax and he's going to use it for hunting and fishing. And he's planning on doing that until he dies. And then he's going to, you know, leave the problem for someone else to deal with. Uh, and that's been a uh, unfortunately that has been a fairly common solution to this. Just realize that. This, uh, you know, every generation that goes by, you run the risk of an exponential increase in the number of heirs, which means it gets more complicated to fix it. So there are different ways of dealing with it or, or not dealing with it, but uh, it's important to realize what steps are out there before you uh, get started. All right, uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the UPHPA has been uh, a big help it's only been around for 11 years now, uh, but states have been adopting this pretty quickly. Uh, it only applies if the property meets the definition of air property, which is a pretty generous definition of air property. Uh, it's easy to qualify under the, the definition of air property. Uh, for everything that we've been talking about today, you know, land that's inherited from a previous generation, that's air property. I mean, it's, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but it, it's pretty easy to meet this definition. Um, one thing I don't think people understand about this law is it doesn't guarantee that land's going to stay in the family. So what this is, it's more of a regimented process on some steps that we have to follow in order to keep land in the family. We give the family options in order to keep the land in the family, it, but it's not a guarantee. So this is more of a process. And at the end of the process, if no other step works, then partition by sale is the, the end result. But they're trying to avoid that, pro, that step, if at all possible. 
And if they can't avoid that step, we're going to avoid the auction on the courthouse step situation. We're going to try to find a way that we can uh, capture the most value of the property that we potentially can. All right, next slide, please. So the first option is we, uh, we want to have so for those. So whenever you have a partition action, it's because one of the co-tenants decides they want out. They want, they want their share of the, of the proceeds. Typically what ends up happening is uh, courts have the discretion. You can either do a partition in kind or a partition by sale. And Mavis talked about this earlier. Courts tend not to do like to do the partition in kind. So that's the divvying up the land and giving everyone their portion. You know, if you have 100 acres and you've got 10 acres or 10, or 10 owners, every owner would get 10 acres. That's you know, 10 times 10 is 100. The courts don't like to do that. And the reason for that is it goes back to that, that state, statement where I said, there's no two farms in the entire world that are the exact same. Well, that also goes, there's no two pieces of land within a farm that are of the exact same or of the exact same value. You know, land that's located near a road is going to be worth more than land that's landlocked that's further back in the property. Uh, row crop land is gonna be worth more than timber property. Uh, land that's got uh, better prospects for development is gonna be significantly worth more than land that's you know, only there for agricultural purposes. So courts have a hard time of saying, well, we're gonna give each person 10 acres because each of those 10 acre tracks may have significantly different values. So courts tend to not like to do that. It's much simpler for a judge to just say, we'll just sell it all and then we'll give everyone 10% of the proceeds because they all have a 10% a, a stake in the property. With the UPHPA, we're trying to avoid that, that knee jerk, let's just sell it and let them sort it out. So the first thing is we got to find out who owns it. Uh, the person that starts the process going, the person that wants to get bought out, uh, we want to let everyone talk and let's see who owns or who wants out, who wants the money. And if there are some of the current co-owners or co-tenants that have the necessary funds to buy out uh, the people that want out, that's great. They will buy out those, those shares. Those people can take their money and they, they can go on. Like I said, it's not a perfect solution though, because you still may end up with an air property situation. You know, if you've got 10 owners of a piece of land and two of them decide they want to get bought out, if one or two of the other heirs are able to, to pony up the money to buy them out, you still have eight co-tenants of the land. So you still have air property, but you've kept the land in the family, at least, you know, through this particular uh, challenge. So. Uh, buying out co-tenants is almost always the first option. If that option is not possible, so either you don't have the necessary funds, uh, there's no way to get a loan, there's uh, too many co-tenants that are wanting to get bought out, um, then the judge has to take a strong look at partition in kind. So like I said before, typically judges don't like to do this. There's not always an equitable way of doing it. Judges are forced to look at this and say, well, is there any possible way we can divvy this land up uh, per, in proportion, not just by selling it? And if there is, they're expected to go down that route, especially if you can get buy-in from the heirs. If the heirs are willing to split the property uh, through partition in kind, uh, the judge is going to sign off on it. So agreement between the parties is important but they're gonna to try to do what they can to keep the land in the family, even if it's not in a, a large tract. Uh, whatever they can do to keep the land in the family, that's going to be the next option. The third option though is if you can't, if you can't buy out the co-tenants and there's no way to divide the land up in kind, then the partition by sale is kind of the, the last step in the chain. And what they're gonna do here is they're gonna work with the family and try to come up with the, a mechanism where we can get the most bang for the buck. So a lot of times auctioning off at the courthouse steps is not the best way to do it. But maybe a public auction in your, your state is more preferable. Uh, you can do a public auction. Uh, the family can hire a realtor to market the land. 
uh, whatever steps they think will be the most advantageous for uh, recouping money from the sale is what the family can do. And especially if you've got ownership um, between, or, sorry, if you've got agreement between all of the ownership, uh, this process can work out pretty smoothly. So the UPHPA, it's not a perfect tool, but it does, uh, it does provide a, a, a good way to keep, to keep that family uh, land in the family, if at all possible. All right, next slide. One other thing I wanna mention, and this doesn't necessarily involve air property, but it involves some of the fights that I tend to see between siblings. And it's a, it's a great thing to think about when you're thinking about whether or not to do a, an estate plan or a succession plan yourself. And that is, there are other things to think about besides the land. And people don't always do a great job of thinking about this. But one thing that uh, I, I mentioned, and most people know somebody that this has happened to uh, at some point in their life, is that having something like a living will is important. Uh, siblings don't always agree with one another. I know I don't get along with my siblings on everything. Can you imagine, though, the fight that happens between siblings when one of those siblings makes the, the choice to turn off life support on mom or dad and the other siblings don't agree with that choice? I mean, these are the kind of situations that it has nothing to do with property law. I mean, this having a living will, what kind of uh, efforts that you want to sustain life? Do you want a feeding tube? Do you want a, a, a ventilator? That has nothing to do with property, but it has everything that to, to do with the relationship between the heirs. Uh, you want to do an estate plan, even if you don't want to deal with property aspects, you want to do an estate plan to have a living will so that you take this burden off of your kids. Because, you know, the fights that, that kids have over, you know, items of, of value, to, of sentimental value. Uh, things like, you know, great grandpa's shotgun or grandma's uh, dining room table. Those fights can be nasty, but the fights between siblings where, you know, they're not in agreement on what kind of life sustaining uh, efforts to keep up with mom and dad, those kind of fights are the fights that they never get over. And once you have a problem with a situation like this, if you add air property into the mix, uh, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to end up with property that gets sold. So just realize that, you know, air property is important, but there are other things that you need to be thinking about too, to maintain those relationships with your, your future heirs and realize that you may not be around in the future to referee those fights. So anything that people can do to, to cut those off in the, in the front end is uh, is money and time well spent. So that's my soapbox on having a, on thinking about other things other than just the, the pure property rights. Uh, next slide. So that's my contact information. Uh, I'd love to have questions from you guys after uh, a Fran has uh, had a time to talk. Thank you so much, Rusty. That was great. Up next, we have Francine Miller from the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at Vermont Law School. And I just wanted to say really quick, thank you so much, Fran, for all of your help with this. She helped connect us with Mavis and has been such a big help getting all this information out and encouraging people to join. Fran? Thank you, Jamie. Hi, everyone, and thanks. I'm just gonna wrap up here by speaking a little bit about the Center for Ag and Food Systems and the kinds of legal resources that we create, including especially the Farmland Access Legal Toolkit. And then I'll just talk briefly about our work in the area of heirs property. I think Mavis and Rusty really covered a lot of material. Next slide, please. So at CAFS, as we call it, we train law and policy students in food and agriculture policy by teaching classes in the field, 
experientially by partnering with organizations to develop free legal resources for policymakers, farmers, consumers, and other stakeholders in the food system. And our students get legal and master's degrees in food and ag policy and can work in our legal clinic with partner organizations doing research and advocacy. Next slide, Jamie, thanks. So here's a few examples of the projects that display the breadth, some of the breadth of our work. The Farmland Access Legal Toolkit um, helps farmers and landowners affordably access, transfer, and conserve farmland. And it includes innovative tools like a, a web-based farm lease builder that help make complex legal processes more approachable and they save farmers and landowners time and money on legal fees. Um, through the Extension Legal Services Initiative, we've created resources for food producers that answer legal questions that could arise in the course of their operations. And we developed a series of fact sheets that answer questions about the FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act. And then with the Farmers Market Legal Toolkit, we've developed legal resources, best practice recommendations, risk management tools, and case studies for farmers market managers. Uh, next slide, please. And then just the last couple I'll talk about, we have a healthy food policy project where we've researched how laws and policies can effectively promote access to healthy food. Uh, there's a policy database in there. We do webinars, there's case studies, really all to help communities develop healthy food policy initiatives. And then the last example I'll give today is the National Gleaning Project. Here we've developed resources for organizations across the country that are working to reduce food waste and insecurity in their communities. And the website is really a, a resource hub that has legal and policy information, as well as a national gleaning map. Next slide, please. So Mavis and Rusty and the National Ag Library have all focused on Ayers property, that's what we're talking about today, which we've been working on as part of the expansion of this Farmland Access Legal Toolkit. And we've added a section on Ayers property to the farm transfer section of the site. And we're relatively new to this issue. I've only been working on it for a couple of years as opposed to the rest of it, a lot of experience. But basically, next slide, please. We've added some background information on Ayers property to the toolkit. Um, we've also just added an essay by Mavis that includes some really concrete suggestions for Ayers property owners. And we're in the process of creating more materials to support families owning Ayers property and the practitioners that work with them. Um, I've just spoken with Rusty about this and he's going to, him and the National Ag Law Center are gonna partner with us on this. We're also partnering with the Policy Research Center for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers at Alcorn State and with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. So we're creating these state-based fact sheets that basically help people understand the legal issues that come up. And that includes information on intestacy laws. As Mavis was saying, these are state specific and can vary. Uh, details regarding the partition laws of each state. Some states have passed the Uniform Partition Act, but many haven't. And then information about how property owners can lose their land through tax sales and adverse possession and condemnation. And each fact sheet will include resources for where landowners can get help. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just the new page that we just put up with Mavis's suggestions. Um, and then the final part of this is that we're providing a list of organizations that provide direct assistance to property owners. And this list is information. If you all in the audience have organizations to add, please let us know. You can let Jamie know through the Wikipedia session and we're happy to add them. Next slide, please. 
And that's what I've got. Um, so these are our contact information. And then the next slide is just my personal contact information. I'm happy to be in touch. Thanks, Jamie. USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender.